The host of this program is an interesting guy. He wants a 20 hot dogs in an hour. You're listening to The Rob Dibble Show. Back on The Rob Dibble Show. Ben Darnell in your afternoon drive. Joining us on the Rob Dibble Show hotline, Dom Mori from the Harvard Current. And Dom, we missed you, man. Dom! Yeah, where, yeah, where you guys been? I thought you guys were ghosting me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Not, Not true, true at all. I just took the run. Yeah, you yeah. <laughs> um, Let's start with UConn and the UConn women last night. Um, what what did you see, and what gives you some hope that uh, things can turn around for the good and the better for UConn women? Well, it's hard to get a real feel for how much what they're figuring out, or, or how you know. It's hard to answer the questions that have come up uh, in a, in a game against Ball State. I mean, Ball State's a really good team for their level in the MAC, but. You know, UConn was able to out-rebound them because they're much bigger, and so everything kind of looked different. If, if UConn, uh, you know, when UConn plays, as we've seen, these bigger teams, they have a hard time matching up. So that's it's hard to get too much of a feel for it, but the one thing you did see last night, they moved the ball around better offensively, and they hit some threes. Weren't afraid to take some threes and hit them, and from a variety of people hitting, taking those threes and hitting them, and that's Really what they need to do offensively is open up the floor. So I think there were some good things, but we'll know a lot more when they play North Carolina and Louisville if they're going to be, you know, if, if they're going to be able to, to compete for a, na- for a national championship. That's, they, they seem like they're a, a pretty good ways of, from doing that right now. On the guy's side, I can't talk enough about Tristan Newton to anyone who will listen to me. Um, Where do you have him ranked amongst the other players, and maybe point guards, but the other players in general in the NCAA? Well, I think you got to feel like he's one of the best players in the country. I mean, he's first of all, he's older. I mean, he's experienced, uh, and and, he came back for another year, which I think was really, really big. And you know, I think now that he's got that, I think what you're seeing is now that he's got that championship under his belt. He's really feeling it, you know. He's, he's not. He doesn't. Uh, not that he doesn't have anything to prove, but he he's uh, he doesn't play like uh, you know, like like he's trying to earn win something or earn something. He knows he has everyone's respect. He knows he's done it, and he's just playing with a tremendous amount of confidence. So, uh, you know, I would think uh, any any listing of the best players in the country that doesn't have him on it is not a very legitimate list at this point. As far as what Dan Hurley has done and Tom Moore and everybody else, just the, the recruiting of players and some of these guys, even Stephon Castle, um, they, they have a particular hungry type of, of player they look for. And, you know, even Samson Johnson, the, the play we brought up yesterday um, from the weekend or, or you know, Monday um, or Tuesday when they last played, you, you know, Missing a shot, then hustling back on defense and stuff. I mean that that's 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 the reputation that this team has. I mean, not just being national champs, but they never quit. They never quit on any play. They're never out of any game. Um, there's there's a certain style of player that they recruit for UConn men. Yeah, there's no no question about that. And I think if you look at Samson Johnson, um, uh, not as extreme a case as as Richie Springs, but the fact that players. Even in this era of the transfer portal, uh, the flow of players out of the UConn program is not uh, is not as, as significant as it is others. We don't have the wholesale people leaving. In fact, for a guy like Samson Johnson to stick it out for a third year uh, and, and try not not run away, but try to win a bigger role, and now he's won a bigger role. That really tells you what kind of program it is and the kind of kids they recruit. He recruits kids who. Uh, come here to play for UConn, and they're not going to give up on it unless they're probably told, look, you're not going to play here. And in some cases, uh, even then they stay. So, uh, you know, he recruits players who, who really want to be here. And, and, and isn't that really the first thing you've got to look for? I mean, players who want to play for you and be part of what you're all about. So, yeah, Samson Johnson is a pretty good example of that. And some of the transfers coming in, he's, you know, yeah. You know, he last couple of years, uh, Dan and his staff, they have not missed on many kids. Um, nearly every kid they've brought in has been 
uh, more or less what they thought he was going to be. Here's another home run for you. I love Cam Spencer and just his attitude. Like this guy is not uh, shy about shooting. <laughs> I'll definitely say that. Uh, but the the moment in Madison Square Garden where him and Baycott kind of go back and forth, and then he pumps the crowd. I just haven't seen a transfer fit in or make such an impact with the fan base like Cam Spencer has on a team that's coming off a national championship. Yeah, that's the key. On a team that's coming off a national championship, you figure it wouldn't be as easy for a transfer to fit in, uh, but but uh, he really has. Um, uh, again, a great get for UConn, no question. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, Seth Davis, a good friend of mine, uh, tweeted the other night how amazed he is that UConn lost the kind of players that it lost and is still so good. You know, they lost a lot. They lost great players, but they also have had a lot of great players coming in. Uh, and, and, hey, you know, they did what they've done, what they've done the last two games with, you know, their, their number, really their number one recruit, Stefan Castle, uh, not playing against Kansas and only just working his way back with a cameo against North Carolina. So, I mean, uh, you, you know, you imagine it, when, once he's a full, full go again, uh, they're going to be even that much better. So they, you know, they lost a lot, but, you know, you, you, the, the term reload is rather overdone. Of course, it was overdone with UConn football, as we know. But uh, UConn really did reload uh, from one year to the next after national championship. Not much easier to say you're doing it than to do it, but they've done it. Talking to Don Mori from the Hartford Current, and uh, just in time for Christmas, you can go get the book he wrote about yeah. the New York Yankees and uh, their early years. Let's talk about their year right now, um, trading a lot of their pitching to get uh, Alex Verdugo and Juan Soto. Your your thoughts on the two huge moves that the Yankees have made so far this winter? Well, I, I, I like them on a couple of levels, but I think the Juan Soto move is the kind of move that the Yankees have not made in a while. You know, they've either whiffed or passed on players like this uh, that have that have been on the market in recent years, including Soto himself, you know, a year and a half ago at the deadline. So uh, they really needed an influx of a superstar player like this to kind of go with Aaron Judge. And, of course, he's a versatile player, and best of all, he's young. If they do end up locking him up to a long-term deal, at least you're not locking up a guy who's, who's 30 and paying him until he's 40. You know, he's, he's a younger a younger player. The Verdugo trade I really like because I think, you know, I, I look at the doubles that he gets, and that could be somewhat inflated by the wall at Fenway. But I think the Yankees need more players like that, guys who put the ball in play, who hit doubles and, and, and spray it around and can play defense. And, and I, I actually like Grisham, too, as, as, as an acquisition. I feel like the Yankees got, uh, they got more left-handed and they got younger and they got more athletic uh, and, you know, with, with these moves. So I, I, I like them. But I do think that the Yankees have a lot of, of holes to fill. And one of the reasons why I might have been a little bit hesitant on the Soto thing was because I think they need to, to, to spend, spread the money over maybe six or seven type of play, players to fill six or seven holes. But uh, I, I think they've really shored up their outfield. Um, they've got some more work to do. They're, they're going to, I'm sure, replenish their pitching. Um, but I, I think, to me, when you can get a player like Juan Soto and you're talking about maybe – a uh, few pitchers who, uh, you know, who knows how many innings you're ever going to get out of any pitcher nowadays. You can make it, you, know, you can get a player like him, I think you have to pull the trigger on that. So, uh, you know, obviously the Yankees got better. They're in a division where you have to get better, where everyone else is, is getting better. Um, you know, I mean, if, if, if Toronto signs uh, uh, Otani, if that happens, it's like game on. So, you know, Baltimore has is, is, is got a, a flow of young players coming up. So, I think the Yankees got needed to get better, and they got better. And when you look at, um, you know, what the record they had last year uh, with Soto out there and a healthy Judge all year, if he's healthy all year, and and and, and a few other improvements, you got to feel like they could be right back in the 95-96 win uh, range again. We were all expecting this one. I think it was almost about six or seven months overdue. They thought Soto was going to come through on the trade deadline, and uh, we heard reports of this trade getting done, I think, for the last 48 hours before it actually happened. The Verdugo deal, though, came out of nowhere, at least for me. I was shocked. Yankees trading for Boston Red Sox. Red Sox giving them up. Uh, your level of shock to see Alex Verdugo, and again, couple this with the Mookie Betts deal, going to the Mm -hmm. New York Yankees. Yeah, um, yeah. Because of of 
you know, these teams have very rarely traded players. Uh, <clears throat> you know, both teams have kind of lived in fear of a play, trading a player to the other and having him make a make a slash. Uh, you know, as you know, there's a little bit of history of that, <laughs> particularly yeah. in this direction. You know, you think Babe Ruth and Red Ruffing and Sparky Lyle and a few of the others that have have gone. So they don't like they don't make sure. for that reason. Uh, it's a shock, but uh, I, I think it's a new day. Uh, the teams, uh, you know, both teams were near the bottom of the standings, and I think uh, what you're probably saying, I, I, I always felt like Brian Cashman uh, didn't know, was somebody who felt like, hey, why can't we trade with the Red Sox? What's the difference? Or why can't we trade with the Mets? What's the difference? And I think now he's got a trading partner in, uh, in Craig Breslow who's new to this mix and probably feels the same way. If we can improve if we can improve ourselves, uh, let's improve ourselves. If that means making a deal with the Yankees, uh, you know, so be it. So uh, I just think it's probably reflective of a new day and new people and a, and a, and a fresh approach to, to this, that, uh, that, that teams are going to look to improve themselves and not, uh, you know, another thing that has to end, too, is, you know, neither team should go get somebody they don't need to keep the other team from getting it, you know. I think the Yankees have made that mistake about a dozen times. So, uh you know, I, I just think it's reflective of a new day and new people making this decision. Any thoughts on where Shohei Otani might end up? And right now, and this is going from today, SNY reporting that the Mets are a real contender to sign Yamamoto now that Steve Cohen went over to Japan personally to meet with him and his people. Well, I know that the Yankees have also put out pulled out all the stops on Yamamoto. Um They've had uh, Hideki Matsui involved. Um, whether Steve Cohen can uh, can I mean, of course, he can outbid the world if he wants to. Yep. Uh, my my guess is that with Soto going to the Yankees, they're out of the Otani mix, and I think uh, Cohen will probably uh, outbid anybody to get him. He's you know the, the Mets need star power, especially after the disaster of last year and getting every, get rid of every, getting rid of everybody at the deadline. The idea of doing that is to free up money to get somebody like this. You know, to me, it's buyer beware there, Rob, because, you know, you don't know if or how much he's going to be able to pitch again, and you may be spending an awful lot of money for somebody who's just going to be a DH. Uh, a heck of a DH, for sure, but a DH. Uh, you know, the Yankees thought they were getting a heck of a DH when they got uh, Stanton a few years ago, right, coming off the 59 home run uh, season. So, to me, that's kind of buyer beware. If you're going to give him a landmark mega contract, um not knowing when uh, or if he's going to be able to pitch again uh, or what his position might be on your team, you know, it's a lot. You've got to really need a big star badly enough to do that and, and have the, uh, have the, the, the scratch to, to make it happen. Steve Cohen certainly does. So I, would, I think the Mets are a real possibility unless he's locked into this uh, not wanting to play in the East Coast thing. And I would say also for the Dodgers are probably very – very much in play or will be very much in play uh, as, as the process. Now that the Yankees are out, you know, I look at the Mets and the Dodgers and, you know, I, I keep hearing about the Blue Jays and that might be a city that he wants to play in. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what his motivation would be there. But um, I don't know, to me, it's, it's anybody's guess. But my, my thing with Otani, as, as, as sexy a star and name as he is, uh, with the two-way thing and, and, and the, the explosiveness of that bat, uh, when you're talking about maybe giving somebody a 10-year contract and maybe who knows 600 million dollars, 500 million dollars, uh, uh, you know, it's really got to be a buyer beware thing there because I, I just don't know what's in front of them. We know what's behind them. We don't know what's in front of them. Speak on the market. I mean, you just threw out 600 million, and I know that that number is, you know, to us baseball people who have been following this, we're not shocked by that, especially a guy who can pitch and can hit and do it at a Cy Young and All Star level. Uh, but John Ashmead in the studio just threw me a story about Jackson Cheerios from the Brewers now became the first player with the biggest contract of $82 million, eight years. He's not even been brought to the show yet. It's the highest contract for somebody who's not a Major League Baseball player. Here's another stat for you, Dom. 56 Major League Baseball players now are making over $100 million on an active contract. And, man, it's just yeah. sad to see Acuna Jr. down here at the number 52 mark. Golly, it's better than Nick Castellanos. But then to speak on that, like where we are, you've covered this your whole entire life, but you have never seen numbers like this. Well, 
what you're seeing is the complete elimination of the middle type player. Everybody is either a young player prior to free agency who's not making anywhere near this kind of money, or for those handful of, quote, generational players like a Mookie Betts, a Mike Trout, or, you know, an Otani, a uh, uh, Soto, an Aaron Judge, uh, they're getting these kinds of contracts. And those, those guys in the middle, they're retiring at 31, 32. They're done playing, uh, you know, uh, probably before their time because nobody wants to pay a, a B player, uh, a so-so player, uh, the kind of money, you know, uh, it, it, something in the middle of that. You know, they, they'd rather have a rookie making nothing and then save the money to pay those handful of elite players what they're paying them. That's why I think that a good formula to rebuild a team and maybe win quickly is something that, that you know, I would advocate the Yankees doing or even the Mets. Try, the Mets kind of tried it last year. I, I, I wouldn't give up on the concept. Sign a bunch of players, a bunch of, of good players, to team-friendly contracts, three-year deals, uh, you know, seven, eight, ten million a, a year, uh, they're, they're going to be hungry. They're going to be experienced. They're going to know what it takes to win if they're the right kind of players. And you know, I thought the Reds, the 2013 Red Sox were built that way. So I, that's that's my take. You know, yeah, you, you, the, the numbers you're seeing for the elite players is off the charts, but it's really only for those a handful of elite players. But behind them, those those middle of the road average players, um, they're not they're not getting they're they're, they're getting kind of run out of the game because of the astronomical price and being paid to the top players. That's what I'm seeing. Rob, you seeing that? I'm totally seeing that. And I wanted to finish up by saying uh, congratulations to Joe Castiglione, who won the Ford Frick Award. Yeah. You, you would know more than anybody what an awesome job Joe Castiglione has done with the Red Sox. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, the Hamden Zone uh, guy got from uh, our neck of the woods in Hamden. And uh, one of those guys that's just, um, you know, kind of the soundtrack of the summer, right? I mean, you think of a summer night, uh, if you, especially if you're a Red Sox fan, uh, he's been part of your life, you know, forever. I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's with you in the car. He's with you uh, if you're not watching the game on TV, but maybe you're on your porch, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, the one, so, yeah, I, I'm long, well-deserved, long overdue, thrilled that uh, one of our own uh, from Hamden got that award. And, you know, I'd really like to see John Sterling uh, honored there. I mean, uh, I know there, he has his detractors, but he's been doing what he's been doing a long time, and, and there's only one of him. I mean, he's, he's, the whole idea that, of that line of work is to be distinctive, and, and John is certainly that. So that would be kind of my next thing would be to try to hope that uh, John Sterling gets the call next year. Why don't you think uh, Dibs' old sparring partner, Lou Pinella, didn't get a nod this time around? Well, I wouldn't have objected if Lou Pinella got in, but I understand. You know, to me, when you're talking about managers with one championship, uh, it's going to be kind of hit or miss. Uh, I know Lou is 80 and he's been sick, and, a, and it would have been very nice for him to get in. But uh, you know, and, and he was obviously a very, very good manager. But you're still talking about the w- one championship, as opposed to, to me. When I think of Hall of Fame managers, coaches in any sport. I'm thinking of guys who have two or three, uh, even if it's especially, you know, I mean, Bruce Bochy, any question about him right. being a Hall of Famer? Right. He's won four, and he's won with different teams. Uh, you know, Terry Francona, certainly no, I don't think there'd be any, any question about him being a Hall of Famer. So to answer your question, you know, I have no problem with Leland getting in. I would have had no objection to, to Lou Pinella. Uh, you know, Tito Gaston has two championships. I don't think he even got close. Uh, number of wins that a manager gets, I don't think really means much. I mean, who has the most wins? Connie Mack, because he managed the most years. But so, and to answer your question, I guess I'm kind of ambivalent about it. Is what I'm saying. I, I, Lou was my was my favorite player as a kid, and I and, and I know him. No I, I would have been thrilled if he got in. Wow. But I understand maybe the hesitancy to put someone in with one championship. Well said, sir. Have a great weekend. Thank you so much, Dom, for your time. Thank you, Dom. Hey, Rod, you got it, man. Thanks. Dom Amore, everybody, from the Hartford Current. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. 97.9.